Death Consciousness is the debut double album from the band Have a Nice Life. Released on January the 24th, 2008 by the artist's own record label, and after five years of writing and with a budget of less than a thousand dollars, the album is a dark, atmospheric voyage into non-existence. Exploring themes of depression, hopelessness, and the finality of death, the album became a cult classic, remaining a rare feat of alternative storytelling and music, and an exemplar of what can be achieved with home recording techniques. Due to the nature of the album and the obscurity surrounding it, much of the musical history and development from the period prior to Deaf Consciousness has either been lost to time or hasn't been documented. There is simply no concise, neat history of the band available. Instead, sparse details are revealed across various interviews and interactions with fans. As such, I have tried to keep this video somewhat loose, as there really isn't an obvious way to talk about this topic. However, some information out there does give a bit of a backstory. Have a Nice Life is the collective efforts of the two musicians Dan Barrett and Tim McCuga. Started via email, the two members met in Massachusetts while attending university and playing in separate bands at the same underground music shows in the early 2000s. Prior to Have a Nice Life, Dan was a member of the hardcore band In Pieces, a band whose sound fits somewhere between the early to mid 2000s emo and post hardcore genres. As the vocalist, the influence of Dan can be heard on the album Lions Ride History, an album which attempted to push a wider and more experimental sound than previous recordings. According to a comment left by the user Emeritus regarding an email exchange with Dan Barrett in 2007 on the Sputnik music review of the Learning to Accept Silence album, Dan states that Lions Ride History was met with a slew of negative reviews, but remains the piece that the band are most proud of and that they practically killed themselves writing and recording the record. Many of these negative reviews and commentary around the album itself has been lost to time. In Pieces, like most bands, went for a number of different reformations, and after the release of Lions Ride History, abruptly broke up after only two full-length albums. While it is relatively easy to find information on Dan's history of music, due to his open interaction with fans, Tim McCougar's history prior to forming Have a Nice Life remains relatively unknown, with little information available over the internet. Tim's reclusiveness is perhaps best illustrated in the About Us section of the Enemies List home recording website. This is the record label which released Deaf Consciousness, and I'll talk about it in a bit more detail later. On this page, you can see all the information to contact Dan, his social media accounts, his email, stuff like that. And underneath Tim, it simply says, Tim lives in the woods. According to an interview with Dan Barrett on the Create and Destroy podcast by Dan Donnarumma, Tim began playing music in a ska-punk band. You were like half you know, like Tim's band, The Danger Strangers, who are like um, this amazingly weird fucking, like just like no experience you'd ever had. Like, you know, I would I would go see them and Tim would play like keyboard and he would have a computer keyboard around his neck and he'd just be slapping it and like screaming. You know, it was like that kind of thing or like they... Um, they had one of their friends play lead boxing, which would be like, he would literally run out with boxing gloves and like punch people in the mosh pit. And it was just like stuff like that. It was just like out completely over the top. It's completely wild, but their music was awesome. Unfortunately, I have not been able to locate any recordings of Danger Strangers, nor am I able to find much information on the earlier musical works from Tim. What is known about Tim is that he has been a public school teacher for some time and maintains a farm with his family. In an interview with The Seventh Hex, a music blog website, Tim elaborates on his relationship between his work as a teacher and his music. Tim states that, Part of me is an anxious, destructive mess, but I'm a public school teacher. I need to beat that back if I'm going to honor what I care about. I never know when, if I really suck one day, I'll lose a kid's trust forever, 
or unknowingly misrepresent myself, an idea, the concordat of worms, the possibility that the concordat of worms is worth giving a shit about entirely. I just can't say, what is any of this anyways, and sit on the ground, sick of assuming we can bend understanding to our language and language to our will. I'm relieved when I can deal with these issues in compositions. Early recordings of Have a Nice Life are massively contrasted to their first release, with this video offering a great example of how vastly their sound has changed in some ways, but remain the same in others. According to Tim, their earlier work consisted of making college coffeehouse sorts uncomfortable. After floating around the Connecticut, Massachusetts independent music circuit, have a Nice Life, like many other smaller bands from this period, feeling disconnected from the increasingly commercialized music industry, retreated into home recording. In a lot of ways, early music released by Have a Nice Life can be seen as a preamble to deaf consciousness. This is seen pretty clearly in the short-lived punk project Gate, released to the internet following the success of Have a Nice Life, which highlights some of the beginnings of deaf consciousness, primarily in the album art, featuring Poleke Fuerzo. The use of classical paintings would be adopted again when the death of Marat was used for deaf consciousness. Musically, while Gage shares many dissimilarities to Have a Nice Life, some similarities can be seen in the use of industrial percussion. Voids, a compilation album released after Death Consciousness, further showcases some of the early expeditions of Have a Nice Life, as it features a collection of B-sides and early demos of songs featured on Death Consciousness. What exactly inspired the final version of Death Consciousness is somewhat of a mystery, although from early interviews with Dan and Tim it appears that they were both experiencing a kind of existential crisis. In an interview with Scene Point Blank in 2008, Dan stated, Death Consciousness is very closely tied to what was going on in my life at the time of recording. It emerged naturally from my writings, and it's the opposite of the predominant cultural attitude towards death in the West. Namely, that we should pretend it doesn't exist. It does exist, and for a long time it was all I could talk or think about. From other interviews, we know that the death of Dan's father was a major factor leading to the demos and earlier songs coming together into a workable project within a conceptual framework, such that, in Dan's words, the period after this event threw things sharply into focus. Consisting of two sides, The Plough That Broke the Plains and The Future, the album features a diverse range of different sounds. From the ambient, minimalist feeling of A Quick One Before the Eternal Worm Devours Connecticut. To the new wave quality of songs like Hunter. The 
humor, self-awareness, and more structured elements of waiting for black metal records to come in the mail. And the explosive post-rock outro of Earth Mover. At times, the album can bounce between shoegaze. And acoustic performances. But, while the album traverses a wide soundscape, it still retains a core sound of driving industrial drum beats, heavily affected guitar, and vocal melodies, all emerged several layers of reverb. Death Consciousness also comes with a booklet written by an undisclosed author from the University of Massachusetts. This booklet helps explain the loose concept of the album. Despite being less than 100 pages in length, the booklet contains a fair amount of information and is difficult to summarize due to a number of different elements. But if it sounds interesting, I urge you to read it yourself. Split into seven parts, the booklet tells, quote, an introduction to Antiochian history through the summary of a highly obscure text, The Books of Terror and Longing, written by William Shelley. While I don't aim to repeat all the stories and accounts contained in the booklet, the basic story arc follows a man who is first banished from Rome, only to later return and become a martyr. The booklet begins with a brief explanation of the history of Antiochus, a historical figure, and the mystery which surrounds his life, works, and even his own existence. We see some hints at the underlying meaning of the booklet in the introduction, as the author tells us that he wishes to document not exact historical accuracy, but the feel of the man and his beliefs, and that knowledge of Antiochus and the sect he founded remains almost entirely within the academic realm. From here, the booklet tells several strange, fable-like stories, related in some fashion to the life of Antiochus, his ascension to a prophet, and the development of a ritualistic cult which sprung up around his teachings, aptly named the Antiochians. The booklet concludes with the summation of the life of William Shelley and his eventual death by suicide. Despite the booklet appearing to be non-fiction, it's difficult to tell if it's not made up. Have a Nice Life maintained, at least in their older interviews, that the booklet is in fact a real historical account, while the consensus amongst fans is that it is not. Adding to this difficulty are the similarities between the New Testament and the story of Antiochus, which are readily admitted by the author. This openness and the way the story is framed make it appear as though any trace of Antiochus would be extremely difficult to find, as in only in old historical texts relegated to some forgotten bookshelf in an academic's basement. If you go on the internet and try to find some information on the legitimacy of this story, or more specifically where it draws its inspiration from, search results only link back to the booklet, adding some mystery to the entire text. The preface adds some clarity to the purpose of the booklet, or rather what it's trying to make you feel. Left by an anonymous, somewhat edgy author, the preface testifies that most remain ignorant of the brutality of human history and the ubiquity of death. We might assume that the booklet offers some insight into these topics. How any of this relates to the music on death consciousness is kept somewhat vague. 
There are specific references to the booklet in some of the songs on Death Consciousness, such as Blood Hail, which, amongst other things, quotes word for word a passage from the booklet, depicting the execution of Antiochus and a retelling of the story of the first man, born without a soul and who successfully kills God in an elaborate allegory for nihilism. But there's also a considerable amount of noise in here for the album not to be purely conceptual. Rather, like is relayed in the beginning of the booklet, the purpose of the album is to present the feeling of the story of Antiochus, as opposed to a more exact musical interpretation. It's the interplay of obscurity, half-forgotten tales, and the poetic vagueness that lead to the construction of the nihilistic tone which permeates the booklet and the music in Death Consciousness. The combination of all of these things and the actual musical genre itself was seen as extremely original at the time of release. This may go some way in explaining the cult sensation of the album. Deaf Consciousness is an album that was never written or meant to be a success. This was recently illustrated in an interview with Have a Nice Life where, when asked if there was some personal fact which could contextualize Deaf Consciousness, Dan states, I don't think there's anything people have to know about us. I just say that we recorded that first record, completely unaware anyone would hear it. We spent no money, did everything ourselves. We were completely in our own world. In fact, at the time of release, only a hundred CDR copies were pressed, meaning burned one at a time from a personal computer. As stated in the Death Consciousness booklet, both Dan and Tim were playing songs in a dead genre. Who's going to want to listen to that? Have a Nice Life's fan base grew primarily from word of mouth, or more precisely, music-related message boards on Reddit and 4chan. Actually, if you go back through the archives to look through posts, particularly around the time of the re-release of the album, you can see the cover art for Death Consciousness posted everywhere, with legions of people endlessly discussing the album, its meaning, and investigating the legitimacy of the information provided in the booklet. This is how I, and probably most others, originally found this music. Why exactly the album struck a chord with this collection of people is still a mystery. One could say that the album is simply too good to be ignored by those who appreciate music. I think this is partially true, and to be fair, it was one of the few primarily guitar-based albums to gain traction around this time in music, contrasted in an industry moving further away from the instrument. Likewise, the drum beats on many of the tracks, while very simple, are heavily affected and add a uniqueness and a trance-like element to many of the songs. It might also be said that there was a lot of mystery around the album at the time of release. Seemingly, Death Consciousness had come out of nowhere. The combination of the artwork, the inclusion of a cryptic book, and the running time, just over 85 minutes, added an element of discovery to the listening experience. One which would be endlessly dissected and re-examined over the years since its release. Many people simply wanted to know what the album was about, and how different elements were connected. To this day, searching around the internet for interpretations on the album will throw up a series of different outlooks, both on specific songs and the album as a whole. Despite its present, relatively well-known status, at its heart, perhaps intentionally by its creators, death consciousness is still an enigma. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the album is somewhat amateurish. What I mean by this is that despite the album having a large and impressive sound, as previously mentioned it was recorded for less than a thousand dollars, and used tools pretty much freely available to anyone with the time and motivation to learn them. To people interested in making music, like many home and amateur recordings which get broader attention, Death Consciousness gives the impression that it could have come from anywhere. More to the point, the album gives the uncanny feeling that you could have made it even though it is such an original and different work. This is primarily due to its unprofessional sound and simple but memorable melodies. The album floated around various message boards and since defunct blogging websites for some time, until it eventually garnered some more mainstream attention. 
this accumulated in the eventual review of Have a Nice Life's later work and the wearing of the now iconic No Fun Not Ever t-shirt by Anthony Fantano, perhaps the world's most well-known music reviewer on YouTube. After six years since its release and following a re-release by the record label The Flenser, the album was dubbed the next greatest album of all time in an article by Vice magazine. Following the publication of Deaf Consciousness, both Dan and Tim have released solo projects, loosely fitting the same home recording sound. Giles Corey, the largely acoustic solo project by Dan, retains many of the same compositional choices as Deaf Consciousness, albeit with a more downbeat and personal style. The name of the project, Giles Corey, is a historical reference to the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 to 1693. Briefly, Giles Corey was an American farmer accused of witchcraft and subsequently tortured to death during a period of religious hysteria in Salem, Massachusetts. After the initial arrest of his wife in March 1662 for suspected witchcraft, Giles was arrested later that year in April with the same charges. Following examination, Giles was accused of being a wizard and, after denying the allegations, refused to plead either guilty or not guilty also referred to as standing mute, a rare event. He was 81 years old at this time. Pien Fort Adur, also referred to as pressing, is a form of torture used in the common law legal system, where a person who refuses to plea has stones placed upon a board over their chest until they either enter a plea or die. After being subjected to pressing for two days, Giles was crushed beneath the heavy board, following through on his decision to refuse a plea. According to accounts of this event, and dramatised in the play The Crucible, referenced by Dan and Tim in several interviews for Have a Nice Life, Giles' last words were, more weight. You will say it, Corey! Speak, man! We cannot relent! What say you, Corey? More... weight! Lay on. Several references to this event can be seen in the first release and self-titled Giles Corey album. Tim has also been working on a solo project, named Flowers of St. Francis, currently in its third volume. Apparently this project is partially inspired by the, quote, active feelings of worry and trespass brought on as a child when renting an instructionless copy of Metroid at the video store. The music is an ambient, experimental combination of acoustic instrumentation and limited synthesizers. Like most of the work on the Enemies List label, it doesn't really fit into any conventional genres. Interestingly, each album has been released in a cassette format and recorded using a handheld Tascam, with track names handwritten on each side. According to the Enemies List website, on the release of the third volume of Flowers of St. Francis, there are only a total of 100 copies sold for each iteration of the cassettes, making them extremely rare. Due to the antiquated feeling of the physical format and the home recording style of each release, Flowers of St. Francis achieves an extremely personal and heartfelt feeling, not unlike Daniel Johnson. Likewise, noises in the soundscape of the music, which might have been more clearly appraised given a higher recording fidelity, have an additional strange and alien quality due to the lo-fi recording techniques. 
Tim has also been involved in Consumer, an experimental metal project formed in 2017. According to a recent interview with Tim, Consumer initially started as something for us to do after Have a Nice Life finished its round of shows in 2017. We got to the end and thought, well, what now? When we got back into the practice room, this is what came out. Consumer explores much more interpersonal themes than Have a Nice Life, namely production, commodification, acquisition, and automation. Both bands share cues in experimental noise music and creeping occult interests, but beyond that, they're very different animals. At this point in time, Have a Nice Life have released just two other full-length albums, one in 2014 and one in November of 2019. Titled The Unnatural World, Have a Nice Life's 2014 album is a shorter, more refined journey into somewhat familiar territory. While I could continue to analyse this album and point out what I like and dislike about it, I think it's easier just to say that it was considered disappointing for some fans of Have a Nice Life. Unfortunately, modern music, perhaps unlike other mediums of art, has an added layer of expectations which can infringe on a band's ability to be creative. When you first discover a band or listen to a band with only one album, you may actually be listening to years of work where songs have been adapted endlessly, which seems to be the case with Deaf Consciousness as seen in the catalogue of their early demos. For all you know, an artist may have been working on the songs in their first release in one form or another for most of their lives up until the point where they are published. I think it's for this reason that some first albums create an unrealistic expectation for following releases, especially if they are successful. After all, if you've been working on an album for close to a decade, as appears to be the case with Deaf Consciousness, it might be unreasonable to expect a fan to stick around for another decade while you work on your next album and attempt to produce something with the same kind of impact and potential originality. I think this is often seen when bands create their second, third and subsequent albums, such that the songs which became the most popular in previous, more experimental albums are adopted as the sound of the band moving forwards, partially due to time constraints or contractual agreements, partially due to audience expectations. For the listener, this means that each new release from a band can become more predictable. At this point, some fans will continue listening to a band because they like the status quo, while others may lose interest unless the band reinvent themselves or return to a more experimental sound. This is compounded by the tendency for people to build their identity in part around music, particularly in their formative years. The division of a community of listeners occurs if the band changes its sound too much, such that, in a broad sense, one side appreciates the changes, while the other side dislikes them. I'm not trying to take sides here, I don't think that either of these choices is better than the other. Change is not always a good thing, but neither is remaining the same. After all, nobody can really say for certain what makes some music go viral, while other music remains obscure. Death Consciousness is an album that went viral on the internet, but it's not entirely clear why it did. As previously mentioned, neither Dan nor Tim expected that the album would be successful. Have a Nice Life have taken a new direction with their most recent release, Sea of Worry. Released in 2019, the album broadly focuses on themes of anxiety in the modern era and features the use of accompanying musicians. As such, the album achieves a much fuller, more produced sound when compared to previous outings by Dan and Tim. It might also be said that, due to the use of more traditional elements, the album fits more closely into a goth rock, new wave genre. While I don't want to spend too much longer on Sea of Worry, overall it is probably the most accessible release of Have a Nice Life, and marks a real departure from their older material. Importantly, I think the album represents a letting go, of trying to recapture the success and sound of Death Consciousness. In a sense, Have a Nice Life have taken a risk with this release, and it will be really interesting to see where they go to next. Regardless of the future direction of Have a Nice Life, Deaf Consciousness has embedded itself into internet history, 
and solidified its place as one of the most impressive home recording albums of all time. Also, its influence on music has been somewhat surprising. For instance, in perhaps the most unlikely of places, the song A Quick One Before The Eternal Worm Devours Connecticut on Death Consciousness has actually appeared on a little peep song called Shiver. This has been, at times, quite a depressing project for me to finish. Some of the subject matter covered in this video relates to things which I don't really generally involve myself in, and I think the same could be said for most people. In my experience, and this might just reflect growing up in a modern, secular environment, it is a major taboo to openly discuss death with the average person something which is perhaps detrimental to our pursuit of a meaningful life. When people realize that they're going to die, that they're immortal, it can be massively distressing and isolating, so much so that entire books have been written on the subject, with authors like Ernest Becker claiming that human civilization is, at its core, an elaborate defense mechanism against the knowledge of our own deaths. Art like death consciousness allows a person to know that they are not alone in their distress. When you look through comments over the internet, you find that people get a lot out of this music. The paradox here is that despite the music being concerned with death, it is praised by some for saving their life. Personally, I find the music of Have a Nice Life so compelling that it makes me want to engage in trying to get a grip on what I find attractive in these dreary, yet sometimes explosive songs, which have stuck with me since I first heard them over a decade ago. Recently, I watched a live performance of Have a Nice Life in Brooklyn. It's cool to know that there are people out there that still enjoy this music, and that Have a Nice Life haven't simply faded away into the belly of the internet, like so many artists that find initial viral success. One gets the feeling that there is a lot of honesty in the work of Dan and Tim, both in Have a Nice Life and with their other projects, and that, despite the nihilism and themes of death present in the philosophy behind the music, there is some relief to be found in art.